Good morning, church. Hope everybody's ready to worship this morning. Please stand and join us as we sing Rest on Us. house and see all of you here. I am Tori Colley. I am the director of discipleship here. This morning when you came in, you hopefully received a bulletin or handout. This has all of our announcements and everything that's going on in the church. There is a QR code on here that you can scan. It has a bunch of helpful links. If you have children, they will be dismissed later in the service, but if you have not, you need to check them in in the children's wing at the kiosk. And you will need to keep your receipt and show that when you pick them up. Um, Let's see. Also, for discipleship, on March 26th, we are having an information session about growth groups. So I'd like to invite you to come. It will be immediately after the service. 
Um, if you are searching for community, if you are searching to grow your relationship with God, and if you don't feel connected to our church, this event is for you. Um, <laughs> Women in Mission has the make and take today. Confirmation starts today. Lots of things going on, so make sure to be connected. Uh, our One Thing Project, we are transforming a shipping container into living arrangements for nurses serving in Ghana. So if you'd like to help us purchase that container, you can put your donation in the box on the table. So actually this morning, Jason um, shared in the first service that the shipping container, we ha now have raised enough money to purchase that. Go. So we've already um, successfully met goal one or step one. Absolutely, give God the glory for that. And thank you guys so much for donating. And so now we're moving to starting to purchase supplies that are gonna be needed for step two to be able to remodel the inside and um, build it to um, an apartment with two bedrooms. And so um, when Jason comes this morning and shares the message, he is gonna show you um, kind of a picture of the floor plan and the inside of that so you guys can see what next steps are. So I just wanted to update on that. Sorry. Thank you. No, that's great. Uh, well, now if you'll please stand and join me in professing our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please join us as we continue to worship.
never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it on, it on, it goes. And it overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never ever have to be afraid. Cause this one thing remains. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out. that we are here in your house and that we know that this is where your spirit moves most powerfully. And we just ask that you be the cornerstone of our lives this morning and every day and just help us to have you and build our foundation on you in everything. Lord, in our spiritual lives, in our lives at work, in our lives at home, we just ask that you be there and that you allow us to build ourselves on, on you like we know we should. You and I pray, amen.
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone. If all this microphone because she and I are about the same height and I don't even have to move it so <laughs> everybody else is a lot taller than me. Um, I'm, my name is Jessica Sires and I'm really glad that I get to be part of this service every year. Um, we are going to be recognizing our babies that were born into the church last year. Um, you know every baby is just a gift from God and they're all I truly believe that they're born to, born to the parents that they're supposed to be born to. You know we might not feel equipped sometimes, or they might not come at exactly the time that you planned, um, but they're always born to the parents that are supposed to have them, and we're so glad that these parents have chosen to be part of our church family, and now these babies are part of our church family too. And every year, the Children's Ministry and Women in Mission recognize these babies with a little Bible to get them started and a little gift, and so we're going to do that today, and I'll be calling up um, the babies one by one, um, we've got one that isn't here today, um, but I'll recognize him as well. And when I call your name, if you'll, your baby's name, if you'll just come up, Kristen will give you your gift and your rose, and then Randy's going to take a picture of you. Um, our first baby who is not here is Charles Gordon Cox. I do want to recognize him. He's sick, so just be in prayer for them and their family. But next, oh, and she's ready, Oakland Ray Elliott. <laughs> Grayson Lane Terry. <laughs> Davis Graham Dykes. Mason Joseph Wilson. Let's give these babies and their parents a welcome. I mean, a thank you. How about that? <laughs> Thank you. 
Jeff, don't let that go to your head, okay? <laughs> Sam. Well, as they uh, head back, kids, fifth grade and under, you are free to head out for your time in kids' worship this morning. Miss Kristen's going to meet you there at the double doors. We're going to pray in just a second. As the kids head out, though, I know some of us here are really visual people, so when we've been telling you in the One Thing Project that we were going to be converting a shipping container into a two-bedroom apartment that's going to go with uh, some solar-powered OBGYN units in Ghana, Africa, you may go, I can't see it. Well, we want to give you just an idea of what we're going to ultimately be building together as a church. A uh, nice little two-bedroom unit there with a kitchenette, little seating area, and then a, a, sh a stall shower uh, with a toilet and a sink. Um, reading the details on how we're going to have to do this, too, is so interesting. I know some of you were just fired up to use a plasma cutter. Guess what we don't get to cut? Any metal, because it's got to go back on the boat to ship across. So when we frame this thing out and then whatever kind of siding we do on the inside, panels or drywall or whatever, uh, we'll frame out for the windows and the door, but then we have to just put that in there secure. And when it gets there, somebody in Ghana gets to use the plasma cutter and not me. A little sad about that, uh, but it is so cool too because like the last wall that we'll do will be the wall where the trailer doors are and we won't actually attach that wall. We'll just build it and slide it in there and then once they get there, they'll secure that final wall and close it up and they'll cut the door and get that framed in as well. The good news is that we have already gotten more than enough to get the shipping container. So well done, well done. Uh, we're looking at a few options on that. The next step then is going to be raising the funds for all the building materials. Uh, we've already got people who've come to us and said, I want to help, I want to help, I want to help, I want to help. So that's fantastic. But we've got to raise the funds for all the building materials. So lumber, flooring, windows, solar, uh, all the hardware that we're going to need, paint, uh, the beds, window, everything that goes in there. So that's the next phase is getting enough funds to do that. Once we get the trailer here on property, we're going to start scheduling work days. And we'll have some people guiding us in that project. So if you are a hands-on person and that's how you love to serve Jesus, we're about to have lots of great opportunities there for that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, um, I kind of feel like if anybody had a bad week this week, it's my fault because I'm teaching on spiritual warfare. So God, just have them forgive me <laughs> in Jesus' name. Um, we're going to move into a, an often kind of overlooked part, a, a part of the Lord's Prayer that we just fly right by God because we don't really know what to do with it. Like it's a good idea, it sounds good, but we don't know how to begin to, to use it, to exercise it in our lives as we try to be faithful followers of Jesus. So God, I, I ask that as we begin to go into this, that you will help us to remember a few truths that we find in the Bible. First of all, Paul's words that we do not fight against flesh and blood, but we fight against the spiritual forces of darkness at work in this world around us. I pray also that you help us remember the, the biblical truth that Jesus has already won the war. He's on the throne. There, there may be still be battles happening, but when we pray against darkness, we are praying from the posture, from the position of victory. And Father, I pray that you help us remember this. That there's nothing that our enemy likes more than to be overlooked, forgotten, and ignored. So Father, help us to remember that as the people of God, we are in a unique position to be the frontline fighters against a force that is here and it's at work at this world and it is anti-God and it is anti-life and it is anti-me and it is anti-every person in this room. And if we don't fight that fight with the weapon that you've given us to fight it, then I'm not sure we're really standing with the legions of your kingdom the way we want to be. So God, we're going to pray this prayer to you. We all here understand that there's nothing magical in this prayer. That it's just words. But if these words begin to resonate with, with the desire of our heart, or if we see that our hearts don't desire the things that we're praying in this prayer, then, then God, when we can admit that to you, you take these words that we have prayed every Sunday, these words that Christians are praying all over the world this morning, and they suddenly become this thing that's not repetitive. They become life. And so God, hear our prayer. We are praying in obedience to Jesus and in trust to you. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our... As you can probably hear, the uh, pollen is kicking my tail this weekend, so I'd appreciate your prayers for my voice. Um, third service already, and then I've got premarital counseling with a young couple at 3 o'clock, and then I've got confirmation with 13 sixth graders at, uh, at 5 o'clock. So it's going to be a day of Jason talking nonstop. Some of you may say, how is that different than any other day? You're not wrong. I'd appreciate it. Don't. don't. I appreciate your prayers, though, for that, because I, I tend to lose my voice when the pollen gets me like this, so uh, that, that would help a lot. In, in college at University of Georgia, I was for a while part of the Wesley Foundation, and we took big mission trips every summer, and uh, for two summers in a row, we went for several weeks to Guatemala. We worked in an orphanage in a village called Santa Rosa. And when you first get there, this is way up the mountain from Guatemala City. So when you first get there, you got to acclimate. It's so high up that if you just went straight to work, you were going to pay for it. It was going to affect you. So the, uh, the guy that ran the orphanage and the head missionary there, one of the things he liked to do was that first day where we were acclimating, uh, he, would, uh, he, he would take us to one of these old Mayan ruin sites. And the reason why wasn't just to see history or to have a cultural tour. He said, I want you to understand something when we're going into these villages and you're ministering with these people. The people you're going to be ministering to, they are not of Spanish descent. They are not even Guatemalan. They are Mayan. And the things that I'm going to show you right now these are things that, like, if the government didn't have any restrictions, they'd still be going full tilt, full bore. So we get to the top of this one. Now, this one was a strange animal there. That big kind of dome rock at the top under that tree, if you'd lay your ear on top of that rock, you could hear a raging river. And I don't mean like the lame, like, put a seashell to your ear and you can hear the ocean. I mean, you hear rushing water and there's no river or anything around. And then he took us over to a different one. Don't, don't shit. Well, okay, that's fine. Yeah, stay there. A, a different one, very similar. And this was when you could still climb up to the top of them. This isn't like the big Tikal temples that are straight up. We got to the top of one, and like this is going to be kind of intense, but in case you didn't know it, the world's a kind of an intense place, right? We get to the top of one, and he said, so Jason, uh, team, this, what would happen here every year is they would have a young girl in the village, and she would be selected, and it would be a great honor to her family. And they would get her so high on drugs that she had no idea what was happening to her. And they would take her to the top of this temple and they would sacrifice her. I'll spare you the details. And the reason why they did it is in their mind, if we sacrifice her and offer her to the gods, then our crops will be abundant, our birth rates will be good, life will go good for us. So they would do that. And then as we're standing there, he said, now you see this big concrete pad down here? He said, yeah, he said, that's actually ancient limestone. And if you move that, there's a pit. So after they had sacrificed the young girl, they would put her body down in the pit and cover it. And what they believed is when they came back in seven days, that if her body was completely gone, that the gods had accepted the sacrifice and everything would be fine for them. And of course, when they would go back in seven days and remove the stone, the body would be gone because guess what the pit was full of? Lime. Right? So it would completely dissolve everything. Now, he then pointed out to us, now you think that's like some ancient thing, but we're about to go down a path and you're going to see something. And it's not going to be on the level of what I just described, but you're going to see something. And let me explain to you what's happening there. So he started walking us down a path and it was going, let's get that next picture. It was going towards, it's really hard, I know it's dark. It was hard to see, but this, this mound and then there's a bunch of trees growing out of it there. And about halfway down the path, he said, now look, you don't have to believe what I'm saying. You don't have to agree with it. I'm just telling you I've been here for 20 years and this is real. He said, there's, there's something here and it's not good. So before we go any further down this path, we need to huddle up and we need to pray for the protection of the Lord to be around us. Okay, you know, a guy starts a story like that, you're not going to argue, right? So we all huddle up and, and we pray over one another 
and we walk up. And you get to this, and the day we were there, it wasn't all these beautiful flowers and everything. It's a collection of stones and dirt that are built up. And as you get closer, you see that some of those stones aren't actually stones. Guess what they are? Yeah. Yeah, not all, but there's some there. And there's these little nooks and crannies all carved out in the rock and the mud. And as we got up close to it, uh, you saw that in every nook and cranny, there would either be a picture of a, a dead loved one, or there'd be a candle burning, or there would be a bottle of tequila, sometimes three, or there would be, um, there would be bones and dead chickens in some combination thereof. And around it, you see people there, there would be Mayans, and they'd be swaying and chanting, or they would be down, bowed on the ground. And the missionary was telling us, this culture is still a place of ancestor worship. And so what they're doing around these mounds is they are crying out for the spirits of their dead loved ones to manifest and to go attack this person over here or this family here or change this thing in their lives. And they're there actively praying for that. Now at that point we're like, all right, cool story. Let's go, right? <clears throat> Let's get out of there. I'll tell you, I'm not a heebie-jeebie guy. I mean, if it's pitch black dark and we're in the middle of the woods and you say, Jason, will you just go walk out in the woods and don't stop? Like, I don't care. It doesn't scare me. I don't. But walking down that path to this site, you know how like in the South we have that sixth sense for a snake? Like, I don't have to see a copperhead to tell you it's there. I can just feel it, right? We're going down that path and the hair started standing up and just that weird tickle feeling and like all of us started getting kind of nauseated, like sick to our stomachs. As soon as we left, guess what? All that went away. And before we got back on the van, the missionary, and again, just hear me out, the missionary was like, hey, um, kind of felt like the, the, the Disney haunted house with the hitchhiking ghost. You know, he's like, hey, we want to make sure nothing's attached to us. Let's pray again. Like, okay. <laughs> so we prayed again and got back left. Now, the cool thing is the other side of it, we got to see the other spectrum of spiritual powers at work in this world. Because the next day, one of the girls on our team was carrying a large container of uh, cleaning supplies to a medical depot, and she stepped on a rock and rolled her ankle. When I say rolled her ankle, I mean you heard snap, crackle, pop. It was sideways. Her leg was not. Instantly turned yellow and purple and swole up huge. She could put no weight down on it whatsoever. The missionary walks up and goes, yeah, let's gather around and pray. Okay, cool. We love prayer. No problem praying. I've prayed for ankles. I've never seen one healed whatever, let's pray. So we gather around. Uh, one girl on the team had her hand on the other girl's ankle. We all had hands on her shoulder. and we We're just praying God's love over her. And that's really what it was. Asking, asking God to heal, but I mean, come on, I, I've never seen that before. And the girl with her hand on the other girl's ankle suddenly says, my hand just got crazy hot. And the missionary says, that means we're done. Like, what? <laughs> She removed her hand. It wasn't swollen. It wasn't yellow. It wasn't purple. And she got up and walked and ran like nothing had happened. I heard things tear. And she got up and she was fine. It was cool to have that dichotomy of experience there. And you may not know what to do with that, but the next line of the Lord's Prayer that we're looking at from in this part comes from Matthew's Gospel tells us that there actually are things at work in this world that uh, maybe we all don't truly understand and know. Jesus, when he's teaching the disciples and us how to pray, he tells us when you pray on a regular basis, one of the things you need to regularly be playing, praying is this, God, deliver us from evil. God, continually deliver us from evil. Some translations render it as uh, rescue us from the evil one. I like that too. I'll just tell you, this is a tough topic to teach on because you always get people staring at you like the way some of you are staring at me right now. Like, what do we do with this? How do we make sense of this? I get it. I get it. Um, the, t the thing that's hard about it is there's always a tendency people want to run to extremes. Have you ever seen that happen with these kind of things? They want to run to extremes. Two extremes, really. And I like, um, I like how C.S. Lewis describes it here. This is in the introduction to one of his uh, fictional works called The Screw Tape Letters. If you've never read that, highly recommend it. It's a fictional dialogue between an older, more experienced demon and his nephew, trainee demon. And the older one is trying to teach the younger one, here's how you mess people up. 
Here's how you trick them. Here's how you confuse them. Here's how you tempt them. Here's how you get them to deny their faith and walk away from Jesus Christ. It's a fantastic read. But in the introduction to that, C.S. Lewis describes those extremes that we kind of run into. Here's what he says. There are two equal and opposite errors. Say error. There you go. Into which our race, humanity, can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. That's one error. This isn't. Come on. Can we go to lunch? What is this guy talking about? The other extreme, the other error, is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. Do you understand that? Okay. They themselves, the demons, the spiritual forces, whatever language you want to use, they themselves are equally pleased by both errors. They hail a materialist, all that's real is what you can see. And they hail a magician, it's all, right? They hail both with the same delight. Because if in, you're in one of those errors, then they got you. They got you. The first extreme, uh, this is the one I'm probably most familiar with. It's, it's all the enlightened people who are far too educated, intelligent, and infected with secularism to believe in demons and spirits and the devil. You may not realize this, but there have been forces in our culture for multiple generations trying to tear down what we call moral absolutes. Do you know what moral absolutes are? Moral absolutes are this. There are some things that are right for all people in all times and all places. I don't care what your feelings say. And there are things that are wrong for all people in all times and all places. And again, I don't care what your feelings say. Moral absolutes. And guess what has guided humanity for thousands and thousands and thousands of years? Moral absolutes. However, there has been a movement, really in our country, the West, more than anything, to tear down those moral absolutes, to, to, to rip them apart, to throw them away, and to act like anybody who lives by them is a naive, unenlightened fool. But the second you begin to strip away all those moral absolutes that have guided humanity for thousands of years, guess what happens to society and culture? It completely falls apart because once you take those things away, you have no answer to one of those moral absolutes that is undeniably real, the presence of of evil in our world. This quote sums it up, and I like who this is from because this guy is theologically and socially liberal. He would not agree with a lot of the things we believe, and yet, as he has looked at culture, here's where he arrived. He said, we have jettisoned, you know what jettison means, right? Just thrown away, discarded. We have jettisoned in the West, that's us, the idea of cosmic evil or transcendent evil or supernatural evil. We don't believe in it. In fact, we don't like to use the word evil because it implies moral absolutes and value judgments. Do you understand that line? Because if you call something evil, you're immediately saying this is wrong and the people who are doing it are wrong, right? Our culture does not like that, newsflash, right? So instead of using moral terminology, particularly the word evil, what do we do instead? We use medical terms. We talk about dysfunction. We talk about pathology. But we don't use moral terminology. And to have this guy say that, that tells you how bad <laughs> it really is. Um, with this group, the enlightened folks who say this isn't real, to them speaking of evil or demons or spirits or the devil, that's just backwards, it's regressive, and whoever talks that way, clearly that person is an uneducated simpleton. But again, I remind you, when faced with real evil, they have no answer. And they don't have any solutions. The other extreme that Lewis pointed out are the people who focus far too much on it. Focus far too much on demons, spirits, the devil... Uh, almost to the point of obsessing over them. Some of you graduated from that church, didn't you? All right? These are the people who choose to see a devil in every shadow, a demon in every illness. I really think it's just pollen, okay? And a spirit in every gust of wind. And one of the things I've done in every congregation, I uh, did it here too, and the same thing happened. Um, I, I try to do occasional, like, ask the pastor nights with the youth. Y'all stop and think for everything that these younger generations are facing right now. 
questions of sexuality, identity, morality, skepticism, atheism, belonging, uh, complete and total anxiety about the future and the planet and everything like this. I mean, these young folks are just facing unreal things. So as I prepare for an Ask the Pastor night, those are the things that I prepare for, right? And guess how often I get asked about those things? Almost never. But do you know the question that comes up every single time? Uh, What about demons and the supernatural? (laughs) You're not even reading your Bible yet. And you're worried about that? I mean, that's like PhD level stuff. And like, let's, let's learn, let's learn to you and your boyfriend keep your hands off each other first. Like, let's, let's get that covered before we start getting into demons and the supernatural. And like, I'm not trying to be dismissive, but it's like, come on, put, put the energy where it matters instead of trying to major in the minors, right? Now, without running to extremes, Jesus absolutely taught us to engage in spiritual warfare. He taught us to engage in spiritual battles against evil and the evil one through prayer. Our weapon is scripture-fueled prayer. What gives power to the prayer? Scripture, because when you're praying scripture, you're always praying the truth and the will of God, right? Scripture-fueled prayer, fueled prayer is our weapon. That's what Jesus modeled in his ministry. Pretty much every time Jesus prayed, he's quoting something in the Old Testament, And he invites us into spiritual combat through his teaching on prayer when he tells us to pray, deliver us from evil. So yeah, for all you enlightened folks here, they are real. And to act as if they are not does not prove your intelligence, it proves your naivety. And for those of you that obsess about it too much, guys, sometimes it really is just the wind. Chill out, okay? But we give power in our lives to anything that we focus on other than Jesus. We give power in our lives to anything that we focus on other than Jesus. And when we repeatedly expose ourselves to things that are dark, be it music or media, movies, friendships, relationships. I mean, you guys have been places and you've had relationships and you've seen things that made you feel the way that place made me feel in Guatemala, haven't you? You just knew, like, something's really wrong here. Like, it's, it's a wrongness that I can't explain. You've met that. When you read the Old and New Testament, it's so clear that there's more happening around us than we're aware of. I love that scene of the older prophet and the younger prophet. The younger prophet doesn't know what's about to happen, and he's freaking out. And so the older prophet prays, and kind of the veil gets peeled back, and the younger prophet looks around, and what does he see on the top of the hills? The armies of God surrounding them. And suddenly he's like, yeah, why am I scared? I've got, I've got angels and a Apache back there just getting ready to blow it up. All right? That's the picture that the, the scriptures give us. The biblical image really is that of a battle. A battle raging around us and a battle raging over us at any given moment. You are a battleground. You know that, don't you? You know that when temptation shows up. You're a battleground, right? Uh, you get the difference between a battle and a war, right? A war is composed of battles. You need to get that distinction because the most important thing that we can know in this is that Jesus has already won the war. He is already on the throne of all creation. When we celebrate the ascension of Christ, we're not celebrating him going up Iron Man style into the sky. When we say ascension, we mean he ascended the throne. He's the king. He is in charge. He has full authority in heaven and on earth. And then he tells us something unthinkable. He takes his authority and he gives it to us. But the reality is that even though the war has been won, battles are still happening all around us, over us, and even in us. My grandfather was stationed in Luzon in the Philippines in World War II. And the war actually ended during his boat ride to the island. He told me that if there had been a U-boat under them, it would have blown them out of the water because they yelled and cheered so loud when they got the radio call that the war was over. Even though the war was over, though, when they landed in Luzon, they couldn't conduct themselves like everything was fine. It was still dangerous because there were still Japanese soldiers all over the island who didn't know that the war was over, and they knew one thing, Japan would never surrender. 
So this has to be a lie. There's the famous story of the one guy who stayed in the mountains for 50 plus years fighting a war that had been over for decades and decades and decades, right? Well, one of the jobs that my grandfather would do, I don't know why he liked this one. I guess it was just, it felt like being off and being away from the base. But you could sign up with a, with a couple of other guys to go drive around the mountains in a military jeep. And in the back of the jeep, they had a loudspeaker that was blasting in Japanese, the war is over, the allies won. If you'll come out of the mountains and surrender, you'll be given food and quarter and medical attention. He said most of the time it was just a drive in the mountains. It was beautiful. But every so often, you would hear above your head, or a bullet went whizzing by. Or you'd be driving down the road and you'd hear a big metallic thunk in the side of the Jeep. Was that me? That was you? Okay. I, better you than me. I want them to think I'm a professional up here. You know, so, <laughs> you do you. You're fine. And sure enough, he'd get back to base and, and there'd be a hole in the side of the Jeep. So there he was in a place where the war was over, but battles were still happening. And you couldn't walk around like everything was perfectly fine and perfectly safe. You had to be on guard. That's, that's kind of what Satan and his forces are like right now in our world. They're in wounded animal mode. The war is over, but there's still battles. And they're committed, since they already know their fate, destruction, they're committed to taking out as many other souls with them as they possibly can. Jesus knew that. And that's why he called all believers throughout history in the Lord's Prayer to pray for deliverance from the forces of evil and from the evil one. Paul echoes this in his letter. We call it Ephesians. He wrote it to Christians in the, the city of Ephesus that formed the church there. And these were Christians who were seeing firsthand manifestations of an overwhelming evil. They were seeing the Roman Empire. They were seeing their brothers and sisters being killed, tortured, killed in the Colosseum, set on fire for lights, for dinner parties. They were seeing firsthand evil. Paul himself is in jail when he writes this letter. So you get this scene of he's in jail and he's looking over at a Roman guard and he gets a spark of creativity from the Holy Spirit. And here's what Paul begins to write. He says, for our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh. We forget that. Our struggle is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness. Against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now let me, let me just clarify that one in case somebody's confused there. That's not Paul saying spiritual forces of evil are at work in heaven. All right? That's not what he's saying. In this ancient first century culture, uh, two places, were, well three places really, were very commonly associated with the work of spiritual forces. The air, the water, and the wilderness. So when this is translated here in English, heavenly places, it really means more just the air around us. That was one of the places where they thought evil spirits could be at work. So he's saying, that's our enemy. So he tells us, therefore, and remember, he's looking at a Roman guard when he does this, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. So this, just picture this scene. I'm not going to read the armor to you, but Paul describes the armor of God. And when he describes that, it's all defensive except for one offensive weapon, which he tells us is Scripture. Knowing the truth, having the truth, memorizing the truth, studying the truth, right? <clears throat> so the next question becomes this. All right, we're standing here fully armored, head to toe. And we've got our sword. How do we fight? How, how do we put it all together and go fight I don't think it's any coincidence that the very next line after Paul describes the armor is he tells them, pray in the Spirit at all times. I think that's Paul saying that the way that we fight, the way that we march out fully armored by God to fight the enemy, the way we do that is prayer. Here's how the great reformer Martin Luther put it, and I love his wording, particularly at the end of this. Uh, Luther was a he was an aggressive dude, so I kind of really like how he puts it here. We must all practice violence. How often have you been turned that in church, right? All the men are like, I knew it. We must all practice violence. And remember that he who prays, which is interesting because men, be honest, a lot of you view, view prayer as this passive sort of thing, don't you? Just be honest, you do. And yet what's he saying? We've got to remember that he who prays, when they pray, they're fighting against the devil and the flesh. 
Satan is opposed to the church. The best thing we can do, therefore, I love this line. Please let this be your image of prayer, is to put our fists together and pray. That's the call of Jesus to every believer. Get in the fight. Don't be neutral. Don't be naive. Pick a side and fight. But remember, please remember, we don't fight on social media. Amen? Jones and for the goods is not where you do your battles. Some of you do, and I know, and I use you as, a, as an object lesson to my children. Don't be like them, right? Prayer is how we fight. Now, this raises a big question for me, and I'd love to just give you an answer. There's not a clear answer, though. Anybody who says they have a clear answer, just take that with a grain of salt. I don't know entirely how to tell sometimes if it's just a thing or if there's something spiritual at work. I don't know. All right? I I don't have a clear delineation on that. So because of that, I pray as if what the Bible says is true. And the Bible does really communicate to us that every inch of life is contested ground. It doesn't mean that there's a demon behind every tree or a spirit at work in every gust of wind. But I'm going to cover my bases, right? Any of y'all ever eat at Weaver D's in Athens? How can you live this close to... (laughs) Am I the only one who knows Weaver D's? Don't even call yourself a Georgia fan if you don't know Weaver D's. Good Lord Almighty. Oh my goodness. I, I'm, I'm just kind of disappointed. I'm not going to lie. Uh, Tondi got me his uh, biography and cookbook. It's a combo. Uh, one day. Um, he's just a big old jolly dude. He's so funny. He loves Jesus, but his theology is, eh, right? That's okay. And uh, one of the things in his um, biography when it came to baptism is he just didn't know who was right. So he got dunked, immersed, sprinkled, this and this. <laughs> To cover all the bases, to which I'd want to say, Weaver, man, I think you're trusting the water instead of Jesus. That's your problem there. But he covered all the bases, and that's, that's kind of what I would tell you in this, is I think in prayer we just need to cover the bases and leave it up to Jesus where it rests. Let me ask you this. If it's true that we're really in a battle, then how many of you are actually fighting for your families right now in prayer? How many of you are fighting for your children in prayer? Your children that are struggling with self-confidence. Your children that are struggling with depression and anxiety. Your children that are struggling with confusion about gender and sexuality and identity. Your your children who, uh, they're struggling with even just believing or having faith. How many of you are fighting for your kids in prayer? Husbands, how many of you are aggressively fighting for your wife? You'd be aggressively fighting if some dude was messing with her. But what about the forces of hell and darkness? Because they are. Wives, are you aggressively fighting for your husbands? Because here's something the devil knows. So goes the father, so goes the home and the church. Are you fighting for him? How many of us are really fighting for our schools? Because if you want to see the spiritual forces at work in this world, I'll take you to the schools of Jones County. And I'll show you that eight-year-olds on average, that's when they're getting exposed to porn. Many of the kids are having their first sexual encounter at 10 years old, not to mention all the other things that they're dealing with. You want to see darkness? Let's check that out. How many of us are fighting for our community in prayer? Fighting against all the addiction, adultery, and abuse that's hiding within the homes of Jones County. Because it is. It ain't Grayberry, guys. I can say that because I'm not from here. How many of us us are fighting against mental illness? How many of us are putting our fists together and praying. We're supposed to be the frontline fighters. Are you doing that? Three, three kind of important things came to mind for me this week um, as I was <coughs> battling the demon of pollen here. And uh, <coughs> I, I just, let's do with these what you want to, but this, this is kind of where my heart landed. Uh, some of this is, is heavily informed by the book we've been reading as a church. If you haven't done that yet, I encourage you to, to get that and read it, uh, How to Pray. A Simple Guide for Normal People by Pete Gregg, G-R-E-I-G. Uh, but the three things that have just been resonating with me is, first of all, a lot of us don't feel qualified to fight the devil in prayer. We don't feel qualified because we know what we've done or what we haven't done. And I would just say maybe you need to rethink things because you're starting with a focus in the wrong area. You're focusing on you rather than on Jesus. Our ability to rebuke, 
to mock and to command the devil to flee, our ability to do that doesn't come from us. It comes from our connection to Jesus. It comes from our relationship with Jesus. Any authority that we have isn't ours. It's His. It's just on loan. There's a great scene in the book of Acts that highlights um, why the relationship with Jesus is so important when we fight against the forces of darkness. This is in Acts 19, chapter 13. The apostles had just done a bunch of healings and had just cast out some demons. And some guys were watching, and as people tend to do, they wanted to get hits on their YouTube page too. So they went in and did a follow-up video talking about whether or not it was real. <clears throat> Verse 13. Then some itinerant Jewish exorcists tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus. Oh, they tried to what? How's it go for you when you try to use God for your purposes? Not well. <laughs> tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. These were the seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva who were doing this. That's a good name for a cat. But the evil spirit, why I said that, Yes, I do. But the evil spirit said to them in reply, Jesus I know, and Paul I know. Think about that. Like, Paul had some notoriety among the demons of hell. Like, he was known by them, like, hey, if this guy you're messing with, if Paul shows up, just, 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 just cut. Just get out, because it's not going to end well for you. Paul has notoriety. I heard an older preacher ask one time, do they fear you the same way? Do they know you the same way or do they know you as an easy target, right? Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And I think there were probably some creative adjectives there that they left out in Greek. Who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered them all, and so overpowered them that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. They made it about them but they didn't have any connection to Jesus. If your faith is in Jesus, if you believe that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus, and if you believe that Jesus has called and empowered his church to fight against the forces of darkness, which he has, if you believe that, then it's not about your qualifications. It's about what we've been saying here for forever. It's about Jesus being connected to him. Second one, this is just good life advice. Don't be stupid. Few of us, if we could just master that, right? Here's what I mean by this. Even though Jesus has given you his authority over the forces of darkness, that doesn't mean you need to go looking for a fight. That doesn't mean you need to go turning over every rock and yanking, over, yanking open every closet trying to find something. Because guess what? They're going to find you. Or God's going to lead you to them for prayer. So don't go looking for them, but when the time comes, you need to be ready. You need to be ready to fight in prayer. There were uh, so many times in the, the story of Israel in the Old Testament where they felt completely unqualified to fight a battle. And in fact, if you looked at it on paper, they should have lost. I mean, they were rice and they were going against Alabama. It should have been a splattering, right? And yet, the Lord said, I'm calling you to go and I am with you. So they would go out to fight and guess what would happen? They would win a victory they had no business winning except God. But then there were other times where they got cocky. We've won all these victories. They should have been saying God won all these victories. They got cocky. And a battle would show itself, and they would say, yeah, we'll go handle this. The problem was God didn't tell them to go fight that battle. Guess what happened to them in every one of those instances? They got splattered. They got splattered. We don't go looking for a fight. My, uh, i got a friend that owns a German short hair pointer. Beautiful, high-energy working dog. I want one so bad, but I don't have time for one. I don't have time for one. <clears throat> right? Yeah, I don't have time for one. Okay. Um, I'd never really been around the breed, but uh, my kids were younger, and uh, I asked, like, so how are they with aggression? And I'll never forget the way my friend put it. He said, well, GSPs, and if you're in the know, you're in the know, right? That's how you say it. You can't just say German short hair pointer, forgive me. You have to say GSP, right? GSPs don't really start fights, I love what he said, but they almost always finish them. I was like, oh, I like this dog even more now, right? 
That's what you and I have got to be in prayer against the forces of darkness. We don't go looking to start fights, but we finish them. Because we're praying with the authority of Jesus and we're praying with truth. The last thing, don't be scared to rebuke the devil. Like if you're intentionally sinning, if you are intentionally doing things that the Bible says is sin, then yeah, you should probably be nervous because you're not on any kind of solid ground because clearly you're not following Jesus at that moment. But don't be scared to rebuke him. The scriptures tell us that he hates to be challenged. He hates to be made fun of because he's so prideful. He runs from the truth. And guess where we find the truth? My feelings? No. Scripture. I really believe... Here's... All right, I'm going to use a gun image. And if this offends you, this is probably not the church for you. Just heads up. I I grew up... uh, dove hunting with my dad and I remember one time I got to use I believe it was an over and under shotgun so if you don't familiar with that two barrels one on top of the other right and this particular one had two triggers boom boom okay I'm not a great shot when it comes to flying things those of you that know left-handed right eye dominant there's no hope okay so I remember being on a, on a dove hunt and yes lefty and, and I'm, I'm, I'm watching and I'm leading and boom and I miss gets away you know what I forgot like every single time that I had a whole nother what barrel a whole nother round why I say that is this I think I think a lot of us are really good at praying single barrel prayers we're just unloading one barrel and we've got a whole nother one that we should be unloading as well we're really good really really good at praying Oh, Lord, heal. Oh, Lord, restore. Oh, Lord, uh, make whole. We're really, really good at that. But there's a whole nother barrel that we have at our disposal. So one of the things I've started doing when I pray for people, whether it's in person or I've prayed this for some of you and you have no clue, and that's fine. Um, take confidence that your pastor prays for you, right? Um, when someone comes to me, and it's just like everybody in their family seems to be sick all the time. Like it's one stomach bug after one sinus infection, after this, after this. And it's just over and over, and it's everybody. One of the things I've started praying is, is I've started rebuking the spirit of sickness in that family. When a couple comes to me and they're struggling, struggling with faithfulness and with marriage, I've started rebuking the spirits of selfishness and divorce. And bitterness. When a guy comes to me and he's struggling with pornography, I've started rebuking the spirits of lust and the spirits of addiction and loneliness and shame. When a young woman comes to me and she's struggling with self-confidence, I've started rebuking the lies that the enemy is pouring into her head through our culture. I just wonder how many situations are happening in our family or around us right now and all we're doing is firing off one barrel. God, do something. When the whole time we've got another barrel that I think Jesus wants us to unload. God, do something. And devil, you are a joke. You are a liar. You have no say here. You have no power and authority. This is a child of God in the name of Jesus by his authority, not mine. You are commanded to leave. Are we firing both barrels? Let me ask you this. If there was something coming after your wife, Something coming after your husband, your son, your daughter, your grandchildren, your home, your health, your church, your pastor, your community. If there was something coming after those things that you love, and it was crystal clear, this thing is bent on death and destruction. How many barrels would you unload? Somebody at Clinton said, five! I was like, I don't think they make that gun. I'd like to see it, but... Wouldn't you unload both barrels? Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? I wonder what would happen if we started doing that. Claiming the authority that we have in Jesus and praying these full prayers, not just for God to work, but for the devil to get out because he doesn't belong here. 
We're going to move to the Lord's Supper now, and I want to invite our uh, serving team, if you guys will come on up and get your stations ready, and uh, worship team, if you'll go ahead and get your, your elements on that. But as we get ready for that, I, I just want you to remember that Jesus isn't scared. He's not fearful. And in fact, the very picture of the cross is Jesus himself looking at the enemy and telling the enemy, do the worst that you can do to me because I'm going to win. I'm going to defeat you. This is not a fair fight. This is not even ground. There was never a moment where the power of God wasn't going to be victorious. And we see that come to a head when the tomb is opened and Jesus steps out fully and completely alive. A new body. He defeated the greatest weapon that the powers of darkness have. He defeated death. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to your table, first of all, we ask you to search us, to convict us, in this season of Lent, show us where there are still places inside of us. That we need to repent. We need to confess. We need to turn over to you. Thoughts, attitudes, emotions, things from our past. Show us what it means to confess and to hand over to you. Forgive us for making it about us. Forgive us for not seeing the poor and caring for the poor. Forgive us for being prideful selfish and forgive us for not praying with the power and authority that you have so graciously shared with us in Jesus pour your spirit out on us please pour your spirit out on these simple elements these, these just signs these symbols this bread and this cup so that when we come to this table and we eat the bread dipped in the cup that symbolizes the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus that we would recognize that that, that is kind of like a seal on us. It's like a battle emblem. And I just have a picture of a lot of us standing there not realizing that we, we're warriors. And I just see the enemy picking on a lot of us because he doesn't think that we're going to wake up one day and see that we have the authority of Jesus when it comes to fighting him in prayer. So God, if there are any battles that need to be fought at this altar today, I just pray you would make it clear to whoever needs to be fighting them and give them the confidence and the courage in Jesus to do it. We pray this in his holy name. Amen. Uh, the altar is open. The table is open. We ask that you would exit out that way to the nearest aisle and come to the nearest station. If you'd like to spend time in prayer at the altar, you're welcome to do that too.
I see bright crimson robes draped over the ashes A wide open tomb where there should be a casket The children are singing and dancing and laughing The Father is welcoming, this is our homecoming Roses in bloom, pushed up from the end Rivers of tears flow from good times remembered. The families are singing and dancing and laughing. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. Heaven joins in with a glorious sound. And the great cloud of witnesses all gather round. Cause the one Yeah.